Welcome back for the final panel. It's been a lot of intense uh, discussion and conversation. We appreciate your being here for Africa's transformation, welcoming 92 member councils of the World Affairs Councils of America and welcoming the audience of Africa Today TV. It's great to be broadcast across the nation. I want to thank the World Affairs Council of Washington, D.C. for making this broadcast possible, and especially to Heidi Shoup, President of the World Affairs Council of Washington, D.C., and Tony Cully Foster, my friend who uh, was instrumental in arranging this opportunity as well. We're delighted to have a distinguished panel and also a distinguished moderator, Karen Atia, Opinions Deputy Digital Editor and Producer of the Washington Post. Karen has several years of experience writing on and reporting about international affairs, culture, economics, and development with a particular interest in West Africa, from which we've seen so many difficult headlines these past few weeks. To her immediate right is Todd Moss, Chief Operating Officer and Senior Fellow for the Center for Global Development. In addition to his institutional and fundraising responsibilities for CGD, uh, Todd, Todd's work focuses on U.S.-Africa relations and financial issues facing sub-Saharan Africa. Todd directs the Emerging Africa Project and is currently working on energy in Africa, cash transfers in new oil economies, and new ideas for upgrading U.S. development policy. To Todd's right is Raymond, Gip, pardon me, Raymond Gilpin, Academic Dean at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, National Defense University. Raymond, you have a very long and distinguished bi <laughs> biography. Prior to joining the Africa Center, he served as director of the Center for Sustainable Economies at the U.S. Institute for, of Peace, academic chair for defense economics at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, and he's held several positions at IntelliBridge Corporation, now part of the Eurasia Group. And finally, last but not least, to my left, Amadou C., who's a senior fellow, Global Economy and Development, Africa Growth Initiative at the Brookings Institution. Amadou uh, serves on the editorial board of the Global Credit Review. He was previously Deputy Division Chief of the Financial Service Surveillance Division in the International Monetary Fund's Monetary and Capital Markets Department. There, he led the Financial Sector Assessment Program for the Democratic Republic of Congo, served as Deputy Mission Chief for the Italy FSAP, and participated in, France, in the France Article 4 mission. He focuses on banking, capital markets, and macroeconomics in Africa and emerging markets. Welcome to you all. This is going to be a great program. Thanks very much. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, it's on. Okay, it's on? No. It's, it's got to turn it on at the back. Guys. Hello? Test, test. Okay. <laughs> All right, brilliant, great. Well, everyone, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm really excited to have this discussion today, and I have a wonderful group of panelists um, to my right to help kind of illuminate um, some of the trends um, as well as the headlines. Um, on Africa that you have been reading. So um, one thing is, uh, well, you know, Africa is clearly a very large continent. Thousands of ethnic groups, thousands of uh, languages, and we have an hour to talk about it. But we hope to at least, um, again, use, uh, use headlines, use the headlines that you've been reading about and try to, to kind of um, and try to kind of get behind what's going on. So first of all, um, I want to start with an interesting economist issue um, last year, which declared that Africa is rising. Um, and I'll quote, real income per person has increased by 30%. Africa is the fastest growing continent. Over the next decade, GDP is expected to rise an average of 6% each year. Many goods and services that used to be scarce, like telephones, are widely available. Africa has three mobile phones for every four people. By 2016, nearly 30% of households are expected to have a TV set. Nigerians are expected 
Nigerians produce more movies than the US does, and opinion polls show that almost two thirds of Africans think that this year will be better than the last. So I wanna focus on um, this Africa rising meme and this idea that GDP, an explosion of GDP, is a reason to celebrate. And I will start with Todd. Um, again, is this a good thing or are there underlying trends that we should be worrying about beyond this headline of explosive African growth? <clears throat> I mean, I think the, the headline numbers are super encouraging because through most of the 70s and 80s, Africa wasn't growing very fast, if at all. Uh, now we're starting to see these economies grow uh, at, you know, five, six, seven. Some countries are growing at 10% a year. It's going to take a while to catch up to the lost years from the 70s and 80s, but we're seeing tremendous opportunities, particularly in places like West Africa, where I know people are sort of obsessed about the Ebola crisis, but actually West Africa is, a, is one of the growth engines for the global economy. And what I, I think is most exciting about this is that some of the headline numbers a cup, uh, in, in the past have been about essentially natural resource discoveries, and we still have countries like Equatorial Guinea, which are almost exclusively uh, about the petro offshore petroleum sector, a lot of these headline, uh, a lot of these fast-growing economies uh, are not uh, uh, commodity-based economies. So countries like Rwanda and Ethiopia are two of the fastest-growing economies, uh, and these are largely agriculture, financial services, um, uh, not the traditional enclave sectors. Even a country like Nigeria, which is uh, the biggest country by population and is now has a bigger economy than South Africa's. Nigeria's oil sector is relatively stagnant. Its growth is being driven uh, by infrastructure investment, by financial services. And why that's exciting is because, is because that means those other sectors filter down into the population. So it's not just a small elite that have access to oil money that's getting rich. We're actually starting to see the rise of middle classes, which then has all these follow-on effects. So I think that's the exciting trend. Raymond, what would you say? I would agree with um, Todd, the um, headline numbers are exciting, um, but as he said, we need to take them in perspective. Um, even though African countries are growing really fast, to make up for the last years, they should be growing even faster mm -hmm. at unprecedented rates for the next decade. Um, but what I want to talk a little bit, a little bit about is, the, is how these numbers translate into the ordinary household in Africa. What we're noticing is not just that services are expanding beyond the main cities, but we're noticing the emergence of a middle class, and the middle class in US terms. Because I was talking to somebody who said, what does it mean, what does an African middle class family look like? Exactly like yours. <laughs> they own a house, which is usually paid for, there's not a really big mortgage market, so most houses you see are already paid for. They own two vehicles, which look like the ones you drive here. They go on one holiday a uh, year, and that number is expanding. Take Nigeria, for instance. Nigeria has you know, 170 million odd people. Most people think that the middle class is about 5% of the uh, population right now which is small in relative terms, but think about it in absolute terms. 5% of Nigerians exceed the total population of a few European countries. Think about it in market terms, and then look beyond Nigeria to South Africa, to Rwanda, to Ethiopia. These are all growing. So you think not just about Africa in terms of the 54 countries, but you think about Africa in terms of expanding markets that are really liquid, because these are cash economies, while our traditional trading partners are still experiencing severe economic difficulties. And so the growth numbers are not just about um, you know, Africa you know, addressing poverty, et cetera, but it's about Africa presenting new opportunities in the global economy and for both investors and um, institutional partners. Yeah, I mean, um, so typically we, have, we, we um, get a lot of questions about Africa, and my sense is that viewed from Washington, Africa is viewed through a few lenses, like aid, 
you know, uh, humanitarian issues, oil. So in Texas, they know Africa pretty well. <laughs> or, uh, you know, conflicts. So it's about security, about um, terrorism uh, in Africa, and some groups like in Somalia, and so on. But recently, there's a new lens uh, through which people are looking at Africa here in Washington, and it's China, the Chinese lens. So China now is uh, the largest trading, trading partner of Africa, so it has overtaken all others. And if you add um, other so-called BRICS, Brazil, uh, India, and even South Africa, uh, you know, Africa is getting globalized increasingly uh, through uh, China and through these other emerging markets. So traditionally, the big trading partners used to be are, they're still uh, important, e European Union and the US, but the growth, the energy is really coming from the region east of Africa, from Asia. And um, that's creating a lot of uh, questions, a lot of anxiety sometimes from, from different parts of the world. But, um, you know, <coughs> there are interesting facts. For example, one would think that um, China is in Africa mostly for um, the natural resources. It is, but it's also investing in a, a wide variety of, uh, of sectors. Uh, you know, sh um, shoe manufacturing in Ethiopia, and so on, and it's also in a, a more diverse set of countries than the U.S. So when you look at investment from the U.S. to Africa, it's a couple, a few countries. It's Nigeria, it's Angola, it's South Africa, and Mauritius for the financial services. It's very natural resource oriented. But if you look at China, they will be in Zimbabwe, where the U.S. would not go, but they would be also in Angola. Half of uh, the Angolan oil exports go to China now. So uh, this is very, um, it's, 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 it, it's, so China is playing this catalytic role and uh, hopefully uh, 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 it's pushing other partners, other partners to really look at Africa with, with, a, new, uh, with, with a new sense of opportunities. Yeah. And speaking of, of looking at new opportunities, so just two months ago or so, we had the US Africa Leadership Summit, um, which was one of, if not the largest gathering of, of African leaders in DC at one time to talk about some of the opportunities that we're discussing here, um, more investment um, by the private sector um, within Africa. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, um, is that representing a, a new era for US-Africa relations and for US um, direct investment in Africa? I'll start with you, Raymond. <laughs> I think um, the um, US-Africa summit provides uh, a lot of opportunities, but there, there, but there are also um, great challenges ahead. Um, uh, Amadou mentioned the um, investment dimension. Um, we don't have a lot of American companies uh, investing in Africa. Um, there are a number of reasons for this. And what are some of those? Um, you could talk about um, familiarity with the African trading environment. You can talk about institutional issues. You can talk about corruption. Uh, there are a number of um, things that really do need to be addressed. Um, but if you do um, look at the data, things like the World Bank's doing business reports, most of the good performing countries are countries that are taking steps to address things like the institutional rigidities, the regulatory challenges, and corruption are African countries. And so some efforts are being made to make um, Africa a more um, appealing destination to um, US investment. <laughs> um, but the other dimension is one of governance. And I was really happy that at the um, summit, a lot of time was spent looking at not just governance as we would think about it generally um, from, a demo from a democratic um, perspective, but also governance from a security perspective. Most of the African countries that are struggling have had recent security challenges. So we do need to revisit the security paradigm and the way we engage with Africa as far as security is concerned. And at the meeting, um, we unveiled a number of initiatives, two of which focus squarely on governance issues and peace and security. 
And um, uh, I think these are very interesting developments that um, would start creating the sort of trading partners that um, would make um, us all feel a lot more comfortable and confident in the future. Are we, are we seeing, um are we seeing a, a reset of sorts in the US-Africa relationship? Are we seeing, um, on one end, are we seeing a, a move away from looking at Africa as a charity, uh, more of a you know, trade, not aid? Are we going towards that uh, sort of relationship with, with Africa? And then uh, another question that was brought up uh, quite often during the US-Africa summit is, now is the US playing catch up with China as far as its uh, engagement on the continent? No, I think I think I, I would not um, overlook um, what the U.S. has, has the U.S. engagement with Africa. I mean, there have been a number of um, uh, great initiatives. Um, you know, uh, we can cite um, President Clinton's uh, Africa Growth Opportunity Act, um, which allows a, a, a quite substantial number of products from Africa to come uh, duty free to the U.S. Um, President Bush also has done a lot in terms uh, of, of um, uh, the health, uh, and mal um, AIDS, and uh, 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 um, you know. Um, so I think the new thing here, what struck me was one, um, uh, the, the, the involvement of the business uh, uh, community. Uh, you know, you, you, it was the first time really that many African presidents were sitting where you sit. And, and, and listening to um, business people from Africa and from the U.S. tell them what, what, their, uh, what their thoughts about the continent was. So I think that, 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 that business element, and of course the new initiative, uh, the Power Africa one, which, 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 which uh, is consistent with this new uh, thinking in Africa that the, the economies need to transform the, themselves, this transformational agenda, and that, uh, for example, infrastructure bottlenecks are really costly, uh, and we need to, to have uh, better infrastructure and more infrastructure. So, uh, I mean, that also leads me to the, to the fact that, uh, so that we understand. Some other parts, though, of this transformation we need to understand better, for example, uh, if you look at the labor in Africa, a lot of labor is leaving agriculture, the rural areas, to go in the cities and to go into services sector. You know, so how sustainable is this new uh, growth engine is? And we have very interesting uh, questions, um, less answers, but good questions. So, I think that there was, there was definitely an element of reset for the White House at the Africa summit. So. President Clinton had a trade. President Bush had the Millennium Challenge Corporation and, and PEPFAR, the big AIDS program. They'd really put markers down that Africa was becoming more important. And I think there were huge expectations for President Obama when he came in. His father was from Kenya. You know, he had talked very big about putting U.S.-Africa relations on a new level. And the first term uh, was a total. It fell completely flat. It was a total dud. Uh, he spent less than 24 hours in Africa, launched a couple of initiatives, they all fell flat. Uh, and there was a real sense that the U.S. was falling behind. African leaders felt that the U.S. was not giving them the proper respect and attention at exactly the time that the Asians were pouring in. Uh, and so the summit was really a chance for the White House to say, look, we haven't forgotten you, we're actually going to put um, our Africa, uh, our relations with the continent on a higher level. Mm -hmm. And what I think was really encouraging is that it was, there were a lot of security issues discussed, but really it, it was business deals front and center. Uh, and we saw $17 billion in new commitments from private American companies, and we're talking about household names like uh, Walmart, IBM, General Electric, um, and uh, you even saw some really small American companies going into Africa for the first time. There's a little um, company in Leesburg, Virginia called Precision Auto Tune. You go and you get your car. It's like a, uh, you get your car, your oil change, and they turn it up. They've just started opening in, in Lagos, Nigeria. So you are starting to see uh, more business interest. The White House, uh, you know, I think they did a terrible job in the first term. In the second term, they've done a terrific job, and they actually brought together amazing people to sit with African leaders and African business people and actually get some deals done, which can only start to uh, feed on itself over time, which I think is, is beneficial. But if I may, I mean, the, F, the, the first term 
I don't see it really as being terrible because the, the U.S. had the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. And if the global engine doesn't work, Africa would, of course, not benefit from what, you know, from, from the U.S. So. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> now, somewhat moving, moving on, we're all talking again about the, the U.S.-Africa summit, you know, U.S. media, at the very least, again, this was a historic and unprecedented summit. However, what was dominating the headlines was Ebola. Um, the first question from a U.S. reporter at, at the, the conclusion of the summit was, what about Ebola? Um, so, um, you know, I feel like this is something that we do need to address, you know. So, um, you know, Ebola, this lethal disease that's been ravaging Guinea and ravaging mm -hmm. Liberia and ravaging Sierra Leone. Um, the largest outbreak in history with almost 5,000 deaths as of today and 13,000 cases. Uh, President Ellen Johnson's relief has called this the biggest threat to national security since Liberia's civil war. Um, so, you know, in, in light of um, having this kind of reset towards towards Africa and this optimism towards Africa um, and towards West Africa in particular, um, Sierra Leone and Liberia were experiencing very high levels, high rates of growth before this outbreak. Um, how is this challenging, you know, our, uh, this Africa rising theme? Um, and especially with the optimism coming out of the Africa summit, um, does Ebola mean that with all the rates of growth and the talk about um, partnership and aid, um, where did we go wrong? Where did these countries go? Where did the international community go wrong mm. with these countries? Um, Want me to take that? Sure. <laughs> I, look, I, I think it's very important to keep in perspective. These are three, uh, Ebola is uh, devastating for those three countries. Uh, Liberia has a very long, very intimate relationship with the United States, founded by freed American slaves in the middle of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. You know, the capital is Monrovia, named after James Monroe. They've got an area of the country called Maryland. You know, very, very close ties to the U.S. We had been spending a lot of time helping, uh, time and effort helping them recover from a terrible civil war, and this is setting everything back. It's a, it, it is an existential threat for those three mm -hmm. countries. But I think we need to put that in perspective that these are three very small countries. Um, the one case of Ebola that happened in Nigeria was contained. Uh, we're seeing, you know, I just heard the other day that a U.S. trade mission to Kenya was just canceled because of Ebola. London and Paris are closer to Monrovia than Nairobi is. So I think the, you know, unfortunately this media cycle has, has created all this completely unnecessary panic. Uh, and what I hope is that you know, once Ebola be, is under, um, is, is contained in West Africa, people calm down a little bit. Uh, it's not going to have an effect on long-term economic growth that, you know, General Electric is not going to pull out of Calabar, Nigeria over that. Um, I, 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 I'm optimistic that cooler heads will prevail, but it has been a big psychological blow. I, I will agree. I will agree. Largely, yes, that there has been hysteria and that there has been fear. But at the same time, I think there are really um, pertinent questions as mm. to, I mean, the implications for our conception of public health and the implications mm. for how we deal with infrastructure, health infrastructure mm. in post-conflict societies, especially Liberia having just come out of a civil war in 2003. So, you know, I, I, I do push back a little bit. I, I, as far as responsible reporting, you know, and mm -hmm. coverage of, of those um, issues, and so, you know, I'd pose it again, you know, to the panels: um, what does this, what does the Ebola outbreak mean for our um, approach to infrastructure and governance and rebuilding in post-conflict you know, societies? Let me um, probably uh, take a stab at that. If we um, look at the disease itself, it's scary. But what is more scary is the fact that, unlike SARS a few years back, or bird flu, it is not airborne. It's not airborne. It's person-to-person -person contact. And so what this unravels is a very weak and probably non-existent healthcare infrastructure mm. outside the main cities. 
because that's how and why it spread so quickly. And it spread the quickest in the two countries that were just emerging from a debilitating two decades of civil war. And I think the takeaway from this should be, as we think about rebuilding post-conflict and post-crisis countries, yes, it's important to have state institutions, but it is also important mm -hmm. to rebuild the infrastructure, the basic infrastructure, health and education. The second thing about the Ebola, e Ebola crisis was not just the hysteria in the international media, but the fear in local communities, which caused many to mm -hmm. flee, mm -hmm. many to you know, sell their assets to enable them to get to the nearest um, city, and has created a huge class of asset poor, poor people. What does this mean? This means that when it comes to rebuilding, humanitarianism as we know it wouldn't be enough because that usually focuses on the income side of poverty, not the asset side of poverty. We need to think a lot more strategically about how we get these communities and how we get these affected people back on, on their feet because that is, I think, the most important takeaway from, for me, that we have to reconceptualize our notion of building capable states that will not just be stable in their own right, but will also be dependable partners for us, both uh, from a development and economic perspective and also from a security perspective. And so that's part of the story. The other part of the Ebola story is that Nigeria contained Ebola. Senegal contained Ebola. All of the neighbors of those two countries have also contained Ebola. And so the question we should be asking is that it's not a West African issue. It is three countries that are post-crisis and post-conflict that require specialist attention as far as the reconstitution of basic services. Maybe if I just can add, uh, I mean, one, one unfortunate uh, uh, characteristic also is that Ebola was unknown in West Africa. So, so if you take the best doctors in West Africa in, 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 during their studies, they didn't study Ebola. They've never had Ebola cases. It was mostly uh, in Central Africa. But so that brings to the fore the fact that uh, um, when it comes to health, uh, uh, these these um, uh, um, type of diseases or, or uh, um, are kind of it's a global problem. If if there is some kind of uh, um, a new uh, virus somewhere in the world, I think all the countries should 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 be prepared. Uh, given the fact that you know um, moving from one place to the other is so easy, so I think it's also a global problem. Um, and uh, that needs to be addressed with global solutions with, uh, uh, in this case, uh, ownership from, 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 from these three countries. The other point I wanted to say also is, is uh, if, you, if you look at from the, uh, the, the economic impact, this disease is having a huge economic impact on these three countries. But if you just take the case of the government, it's like a double whammy. At, on the one hand, your health expenditures are increasing, you have this emergency, so your spending uh, is increasing, and at the, uh, on the other hand, your revenues are falling down because it, the it, trade is going down, economic activity is going down. And there, uh, they really need help very quickly. Uh, so, so that's something, uh, again, that where the global community also ha has to be involved. Mm -hmm. okay. And so this year, another headline that, that dominated, especially in the very beginning of the year was the um, it's Nigeria's struggle against Boko Haram and terrorism in, in West Africa. I know we don't have too much time, but I'd like to sort of touch uh, to touch on that, um, and especially um, with you, Raymond. Um, you know, so earlier in uh, the year, um, the big headline story was Boko Haram kidnapped almost 300 schoolgirls in northeastern Nigeria. Um, six months later, they have not been recovered. And it really highlighted for a lot of the global community um, this group that has been terrorizing Nigeria since really actively 2009, for, so for several years, that has been terrorizing 
Nigeria and that the government has not been able to have to get a handle on uh, this group. Um, so it really put uh, terrorism and uh, security into the world's um, into the world's sort of view. So again, as far as a challenge to that Africa rising, that Africa transforming narrative, how does a group such as Boko Haram and the government's inability to somehow really actively deal with this scourge, how does that challenge our ideas of <coughs> Africa transforming? Um, uh, the Boko, Har Boko Haram threat in um, northern, um, northeastern Nigeria um, is definitely a serious challenge. Um, but it is peculiar in a number of regards. Uh, mm -hmm. The first is that it is this insidious transnational um, threat that um, seems to exist in a, an area that is poorly governed. And if you look across the world, there are many of these sort of areas where non-state actors could set up shop, you know, claim territory and flout everything that is sovereign and decent. Um, the problem in um, the, the the problem there then becomes how do you address it in a region? that has been marginalized by both central and state governments for a long time. And so it's very easy for them to blend in with the local communities. And then you ask yourself, what are the instruments that a government has to deal with something like this? And uh, you come up with the answer, very few. Um, because our tra the traditional instruments that the Nigerian government would have would be Law enforcement, that's practically non-existent and ineffective. And you think, what about the military? The military might be great, but they're not good at addressing insurgencies or rebel groups. They're good at fighting other armies. That's what they're trained to do. They're not trained to do that sort of um, warfare. You think about, OK, well then, what about the um, development side? That takes time, mm. and it requires trust, which has not existed. And so we see this um, confluence of very, very troubling factors that make it possible for an entity like Boko Haram to exist with impunity. It then becomes, to my mind, more of a regional challenge. We need um, not just the Nigerian government, but we need the other neighboring governments to come together and say, we are going to deny them sanctuary, not just militarily, but diplomatically, economically, and also um, socioeconomically, to ensure that they don't have the oxygen to breed, to breed and to breathe. If you remember before Boko Haram, there was Joseph Kony doing the same thing in Central Africa. Sudan. And again, Uganda. this again speaks to the heart of what I call um, in some of my uh, classes, we have to reverse engineer the Westphalian concept. Because democracies as we know them across the world, and in Africa as well, are all about the viability of the nation states. And what the Treaty of Westphalia did was bring many European nations together into states. What we have in Africa are many states that are now struggling to be nations, to be relevant to their people. That's all what nationhood is about. And um, we, as uh, partners of African countries, really need to think seriously about how we reconnect them. We've been overly enamored by elections. But what we really do need to do is we can we constitute this relationship between those being governed and those in governing positions at national, local, and community levels. And those are the failings, I think, in um, northeastern Nigeria that we need to address if Boko Haram is going to be um, taken care of. So speaking of states and nationhood, this is a perfect segue into my next, uh, my next question um, about what will be the headlines to come, and that is the fact that some 30 
African states will be facing elections between now and 2016, including Nigeria, which we just spoke mm -hmm. about, including Burkina Faso, which has been in the news for, um, for the popular uprisings that have uprooted long -time president, um, the long-time president of Burkina Faso. Um, so looking ahead um, to 2015 and into 2016, um, with a lot of these uh, nations facing very potentially contested elections, um, could we say that next year is a, um, is a, that we should be nervous about 2015 for, for Africa um, as a continent? Or are there trends that, you know, are there elections that you're watching that you're um, particularly uh, optimistic about? So, I mean, we, I am at the Africa Growth Initiative, so we always look at, at things from the growth side, economic side. So, I mean, Nigeria is definitely, in terms of the economy, I mean, it's the largest economy now in Africa. It's, uh, again, I've used this word three times, but it's a good growth engine for Africa and for West Africa in particular. So, there's, you can see already um, stock market in Nigeria have gone down. There's a lot of uncertainty with the oil price and the elections. So, uh, you know, uh, a, you know a reducing this uncertainty with, you know, um, uh, elections that, 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 that um, are successful uh, would be very good for that region. Um, else, I'm not that nervous. There will be some, some cases where, you know, uh, con conflicts is possible, like Burundi. Uh, or a Central African Republic, which is already having some issues. But th those are kind of contained, I think, in, in low intensity. Uh, they will be, it, it, of course, uh, uh, there's a humanitarian side of it. There's loss of life. There can be loss of life, so that would be sad. But um, yeah, so, but I would say just, if you look at the trend over time, Africa has democratized more. I mean, if you take like 30 years earlier, we had uh, less successful elections. But I think the, the one, 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 one trend to watch is to, when we start moving from successful elections to, uh, you know, not having the elections, just, just the elections as the measure of democratization, but what happens after the elections? Are we having strengthened institutions and so on? Yeah. So. Look, you've got, and I'm actually very, very optimistic, even despite these uncertainties, you've got a collision course going on here. You have what Raymond was talking about, which is the growth of the middle class, and middle class people do not want to be ruled by autocrats, right? They do not want to live in the, new, in, the, in the old world. They want to have a new world. You're seeing in a place like Nigeria an incredible rise of civil society groups, including middle class people who who don't want the politicians stealing all the money, uh, and a very active young uh, social sector of young people that are saying, look, we are the new generation. We want to have a, a better future. Um, that, is colliding, uh, um, that is colliding with uh, the number of uh, still longtime uh, autocrats that you have in power. Uh, so uh, Blaise Compare was just overthrown on Friday. He'd been in power 27 years. Uh, there are actually 10 other African leaders that have been in power at least 20 years. Many of these guys are very old uh, men. Uh, they're all men. Um, some of them will pass. Some of them will be overthrown. I think that's actually very positive, and we're going to see a new generation of leaders. And a lot of that will support the economic growth because um, these are going to be uh, jobs and businesses that are not reliant on old mm -hmm. corrupt business networks. It's going to be people that are going to be rich because they're connected to Wall Street or London, uh, not because they're the cousin of the president. And I think that's only positive in the long term. All right. Let me just give you uh, two quick vignettes um, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, buttress um, what um, Todd has just said. Um, you know, in Ghana, uh, the, the last Ghanaian elections, um, you had over for the presidential runner, you had over eight million votes cast. The difference between the winner and the loser was less than forty thousand. But you had a peaceful transition. You had um, a constitutional challenge; it went through the courts, so the courts um, ruled, and you had a peaceful transition, um, largely because the Ghanaian middle class 
people who understand not just the values, but they have a stake in stability, and they participate in it. Um, Malawi, a few years back, mm -hmm. the long time um, head of state uh, passed, and there was a big groundswell for the military to take over. People actually asked the military to take over. The then head of the military, General Odilo, said, no, there's a constitution. And the constitution was followed. The vice president became um, head of mm -hmm. state as the constitution um, uh, prescribed. 10, mm -hmm. 20, 30 years ago, this would not have happened. Mm -hmm. And so there's a positive trend across the continent. Will there be the odd blip from time to time? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But that does not define the continent. I think what defines the continent is this trend of not just um, more participation by this you know, Africa's millennials, but also the realization that the institutions serve the state and not the regime. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have time for questions. Yeah. Um, all right, right here in the boots. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Hi, um, Ellen Keefe, and thank you so much um, to the panel for being here and for the discussion. I know we just briefly mentioned when you said men, only men, um, and so that brings up women. And mm. I just wonder if each of you may um, address some of the issues with the women and what kinds of things you see um, in terms of humanitarian rights um, for the future. Thank you. <laughs> Are we taking I don't know, do you want to take it? Um, yeah, maybe we can take a number of them just in the interest of time and then try to you know, make a note and um, then try to answer them. Um, okay. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Sky Forrester from Colorado Springs. Um, yeah. We talked about the millennials, the changing demographics, and the, and the optimism, and I share the optimism, although most Americans, particularly outside of the Beltway, only have one image of Africa, and it's about Ebola and civil war. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of conflicts, obviously, in, you know, on the continent. I guess my, my question would be the sectarian conflicts, the schisms, whether it's race, ethnicity, tribalism, or what have you, as you go through these political transitions and you move from autocracy, as you talked about, do those schisms become, do those conflicts become more important and more mani less manageable, or are they going to be able to be managed indigenously within those societies? What's your sense of that? Related to the security situation, uh, we now have an Africa command as part of our military structure. Um, and we often hear the expression, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so I'm wondering if, uh, when, as you think about US policy towards Africa, obviously we've had uh, Mali, and now the US is looking at uh, you know, an air base in, in the area, and uh, uh, drones, et cetera. Can you simply give us your perspective on whether you worry that uh, we are going to approach our policy uh, too much from a, a military standpoint? Maybe. Hi, uh, my name is Liz Naduva. I'm from the World Affairs Council of Atlanta, and my question deals with primarily the first headline that you were talking about, Africa on the Rise, and my question deals with microfinance and microfinancing programs and whether or not that led to the rise that we have seen in Africa and how has that contributed primarily, and whether or not if um, that will help rebuild and reconstruct the failing institutions that we've seen in Sierra Leone and Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire. Thank you. That's a good batch to start with. Um, Raymond, would you like to take some of the questions about uh, Africa and the US military engagement on the continent? Oh, I thought yeah. you were going to oh. ask the question. Um, no. Yeah, I was just taking <laughs> okay. that little stab at, at that particular question. Um, do I think that uh, we're going to um, overly militarize um, our approach in Africa? I don't think so. I think Africa is one of the places where we do tend to have um, a more balanced approach to our interventions. If you look at the um, response to the Ebola crisis in Liberia, 
Um, what we have are uniformed boots on the ground, and the boots on the ground are doing one thing and one thing only. They are constructing field hospitals. And then US um, Agency for International Development, US NGOs, who then help run staff and run and staff these um, entities and sensitize um, the communities. Um, and places like um, Burkina Faso and um, the, um, uh, the um, area of surveillance um, issue that you mentioned. Um, it's, um, you know, the Sahel, the um, Sahara Desert and uh, everything near the south, it's a huge area. And what happened when the so-called Arab Spring transpired is a lot of bad people and heavy weapons moved south. And it's really difficult to keep a track on what's mm. going where. We only knew about um, some when they turned up in Mali and they wreaked havoc and divided the country until the French, in, until the French in, intervened. So that's the context in which there is quite a bit of, um, there, is, there, has been, there has been some emphasis on the aerial surveillance um, side of things, but um, it's been generally um, more, more balanced than in most of the areas in the world. On the conflicts and um, political transition, I think that's a very um, good question. Um, politics uh, worldwide is by nature, you know, factional. And um, would we see, um, you know, um, tradition, um, legacy groupings, be they ethnic or religious, defining politics? Absolutely, it happens everywhere in the world. Um, but uh, to your question, would those, would, would the um, institutional trappings of democracy make it more manageable? Um, I'd point to a country like um, Senegal. Um, Senegal is very Islamic. You have the extremes of Islam in Senegal and in Senegalese politics, and we don't have the sort of extremism we have elsewhere because both the um, institutions of state and Senegalese politics has matured to the extent that you could have elections, you could have people, you know, line up behind um, entities with which, with which or with whom they identify, and it doesn't become. Um, a conflict, it doesn't become violent conflict. And um, when we um, meet with a lot of delegations from African countries, we point to countries like Senegal, that is religiously diverse, ethnically diverse, but has a democratic tradition that holds and is on African soil. And so we're seeing a lot of that um, beginning to um, you know, take hold elsewhere. Uh, I wanted to go to Ahmed, yeah, that's actually, for me. on yeah. the question, um, Tony's question microfinance. on microfinance. Yeah, sure. So I think that's a very interesting question. And there's a lot of changes happening uh, in the financial landscape uh, in the countries. So uh, uh, microfinance, so these small loans to, to people in the urban and rural areas have grown, I mean, the microfinance institutions have grown very, very rapidly. But at some point, they reach a limit uh, and you know, like the, uh, there is this term coined the missing middle because at, on, on one side you have the commercial banks that will only cater to the large corporations and so on, and the microfinance institution that only cater to you know, the poorest of the poor. And you have all these entrepreneurs, these small medium enterprises that cannot get any funding. Right, so uh, another also, um, so that's one. So you've seen trends, some banks, when they saw that uh, microfinance institutions were becoming very large, uh, like in my, in my country, Senegal, you have very large ones. Um, you see the headquarters, you wonder, are they really catering to the poor? Is this really a successful model? But they are not banks, so they don't have access to the payment system. You cannot write a check and so on. So some banks were trying to have models where either they take over a microfinance institution or they open a microfinance window or they partner with microfinance institution and refinance them. So that's happening. Another in interesting uh, uh, issue also is the mobile payments. 
system where you know you had the microfinance, it worked well, but suddenly you have these telecom operators that can offer now these mobile payments. So uh, you can pay your electricity account with your cell phone. You can transfer money to your uh, uh, cousin at the village with your cell phone. Uh, it's working very well. And now you can even transfer money from Rwanda to Tanzania in different currencies, from Mali to Cote d'Ivoire to uh, Senegal in the same currency. So it's working very well and uh, um, you know, uh, it's kind of compete but also complement the microfinance institution. So a lot is happening but uh, uh, this mobile payment system and you know, it's coming in the US. <laughs> sorry, I, so, sorry, I could not hold it. It's, it's, it's very interesting, yeah. I wanna go back to the first question yeah. about women in Africa, of course. Yeah. Have a male panel, but women are, you know, a huge, huge part of Africa's transformation. So I'd like any one of you to comment on the role of women, um, and uh, the role of women in, in Africa's uh, rise. What should I do? Sure. I mean, I, I would say two two things, and then I do want to comment on the militarization of U.S. policy. First, you know, right now, arguably the most capable. Um, uh, head of state, right, in, in Africa is uh, Ellen uh, Johnson Sirleaf of, of Liberia. I think she's been a tremendous, I know she's much more popular in Washington than in parts of Africa, but she's, uh, she's been a tremendous uh, role model for people, uh, for young women across Africa, and I think is really seeing a very strong uh, woman uh, has changed perceptions among many of the other uh, African leaders. We, we do see, you know, just younger generations are gonna be more used to uh, seeing women in powerful positions. Uh, you know, as we have fewer 80 plus um, autocrats and more young people come into positions of power, we're gonna see that naturally, it will take time. Uh, for regular average African women, what I found stunning is that, um, when you look at the transition of the, the demographic transition where fertility plummets, in a country like Mexico or Iran, uh, the average ch uh, children per woman went from five or six to two within one generation. Uh, and we're starting to see that in some parts of Africa, but the only place left on the planet where fertility rates are over five or six is West Africa. And it's the poorest West African countries like Mali, uh, and Niger, which still have sort of six plus. Um, and that's, a, you know, there, it's a complex reason for that, but that's gonna be something that's going to certainly hold back uh, or delay uh, the status change. Uh, but certainly that is one of the underlying demographic trends that's gonna make Africa uh, better in the future as that, as that improves. Uh, I think we have just a little bit more. <laughs> a little bit more okay. Yeah, just on, on uh, so I was at the State Department in 2007, 2008, when AFRICOM was created, and there was very clearly, um, uh, you know, there was a lot of concern that we were gonna over-militarize. It, you know, if there is Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb running around the Sahara Desert, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, Boko Haram in Nigeria, and these groups seem to be cooperating, the U.S. military is going to respond. I think we want them to respond. So we are going to see much more active counterterrorism operations in Africa. Washington Post has done a fantastic job reporting on all the forward drone bases um, that are being pushed out. So I think we are going to see counterterrorism. On the flip side, the U.S. government has multiple competing interests. That gets reflected in the government. We still have an interest in promoting democracy. We still have an interest in promoting development. That gets fought out um, within the US, within US foreign policy. Sometimes the military is gonna win. Sometimes the democracy promotion imperative is gonna win. And if I can be sort of gross self-promotion, when I left state, I started writing about this, what happens after a coup when DOD fights with state about security versus democracy. I did it based on a real coup in Mauritania, and I decided it would be more fun to do it in a novel, and I wrote a thriller about a crisis manager at state working on a coup in, to reverse a coup in Mali during a terror threat. Happens to be for sale, I didn't know it. Happens to be for sale at <laughs> the table the outside. outside. The it's called The Golden Hour. Uh, happens to be right um, here. Oh, there it is, there it is. There. Happens to be oh, right here. Wow. Um, yeah. However, <laughs> yeah, you know, not only can you purchase Todd's book, but you can 
see the extensive <laughs> blogging by Amadou C and Raymond Gilpin as well, and Karen, Karen Ati is all over the web for the Washington Post uh, and others, other sources. Thanks very much for joining this. Thank you, panel, for Thank a you. great job. <laughs>